Okay, I think we can just get started. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Sunday Assembly San Diego. This is our 68th assembly. We're like a new mom saying, yes, this is my son. He's 42 weeks. Like, what's that mean? We've been at it a few years now, and uh, we've finally gotten it down to a complete science. There will be no mistakes from our MCs. I'm one of your co-MCs. My name is Alexis Record. And my name is Charles Wesley. And <laughs> he's done talking. <laughs> Just like a well-oiled machine. Um, we have a media-free zone over here because we will be filming this for people that have to miss. We have childcare available by professionals. Um, if you are 1.5 years and older, you can go there. Uh, how many weeks is that? Let's see. You are something months. And then uh, and they can see you, you can see them, but it's hard to hear them until the moment of silence when everyone hears Roland. All right, we are, I'm not very musical. Are you very musical? No. I have been known to play the stereo. <laughs> well, y Charles and I are not very musical, but we are so thankful for people who can donate their musical abilities to the group. And I just want to welcome Tim McCracken. <laughs> yeah. All right, well, hello, everybody. Well, we got a brand new year, so we got a brand new decade, too. So let's uh, get it started off right with the Welcome to Sunday Assembly song. And. Uh... <laughs> Welcome to Sunday Assembly I look round the room and must say Two familiar old faces and new ones We're glad that we're here with you today We're glad that you came here today We're glad that you came here today Two familiar old faces and new ones We're glad that you came here today When our assembly is over, we hope that you don't have to run. We'd really like to get to know you, so stick around after we're done. Oh, stick around after we're done. Stick around after we're done. we really like to get to know you, so stick around after we're done. We like to sing songs when we gather, so rock, pop, and ballads we crew. We raise up our voices in verses, and sometimes we sing them in two. Oh, sometimes we sing them in two. Sometimes we sing them in two. We raise up our voices in verses, and sometimes we sing them in two. And after the last song is sung Introduce yourselves to one another And you won't be a stranger for long 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 And you won't be a stranger for long Now this last verse is a little bit tricky So we're going to lump the... Uh, Help live better, help often, and wonder more. It's help often, wonder more. It's just one word. We're making a new word today, so. <laughs> so. so. All right, so you ready? Here we go. Welcome to Sunday Assembly. We greet you with wide open doors. We're certainly glad that you joined us. To live better, help often, wonder more. Live better, help often, wonder more. Live better, help often, wonder more. Glad that you joined us. We better help off the one
Thank you, Tim McCracken. This is the Life Happens portion of our, of our service. We, uh, at, at Sunday Assembly, we are here to live better, help often, wonder more. And part of living in community is celebrating each other's successes and, and mourning with each other and experiencing life together. So there are index cards on the table as you walk in, and next time you come in, if you would like to share something with us, either anonymously or with your name on it, you can write that down on that index card and we will share it with the group. And uh, most people don't know this, we sell this information to Google afterwards, so if you, could, if you could tell us what brands you're into or if you're trying to buy a car in the near future, we would appreciate that, thank you. My last Sunday Assembly San Diego as a resident of this amazing city. I have grown and learned so much here in my four years. I attribute much of my success and well-being to my community and support system here with our community. I love you all and we'll see you again. I'm excited to, to join Sunday Assembly Sacramento. My next chapter begins, thank you all, Amber. Although I sometimes had extremely long days on two hours sleep, I completed balance theory. I went from high risk of falling to a normal risk. I still use a cane for balance and support, but I'm amazed by how helpful it was. Emily. <laughs> Veronica celebrated six years clean from opioids this month. And, <laughs> and Jeffrey made good progress in his physical therapy. After practicing for three weeks, getting in and out of his physical therapist's car, he was able to do it without help. <laughs> and Andrew Harrison is going to share a life event. I became a grandfather for the third time, and so um, my granddaughter, <clears throat> uh, my, my son, my oldest son, um, had a, and his wife had a daughter. Um, I'm sorry, it's been a while since I stood before an audience, but, um, <laughs> uh, and so that's number three granddaughter, and I have one more, uh, my first grandson will be born next month. My daughter's pregnant, so I'm super excited. Um, anyway, um, her name is uh, Briar Faye Harrison, so. Every Sunday Assembly has a theme, and our theme this month is connections. So this is really meaningful to me. Um, and Amber, I'm going to reach out to David Diskin at Sunday Assembly Sacramento and warn him you're coming. <laughs> The trouble is coming, the storm. And um, I'm just so happy about all the connections we've made. Um, this is the part of assembly we talk about, Help hap Happens, where we reach those connections out into our community. Um, and the person that was gonna do this is Jen, and I just wanna brag on her a little, since she's not here and she's sick, that she is the one that makes so many assemblies happen. She is the behind the scenes of so many of our programs. She is the rock in community service committee. And, um, but today we're gonna to be hearing from her understudy. Come on up. And while she's coming on up, uh, <laughs> wait for it. The performative section, standing up. Jeffrey, when you shared about getting in and out of the car, her therapist worked on that for years. I know that is a huge deal. He says he's gonna keep going and keep working on it too and not stop. Keep fighting. Do you have her paper? Do you have her paper? 68th. Doing this so long. We know exactly what we're doing. All right.
You think I know how to lower the thing? How many times have we been doing this? <laughs> Hi. <laughs> Thanks for coming to Sandwich Saturdays last night. We made 200 sandwiches. Well, you made the sandwiches while I entertain you with stories about cats. <laughs> we also had bananas, oranges, new socks, and other things. Sunday Assembly provided hundreds of cookies to complement the meal. They were a big hit. We have an upcoming community service event at our beach. It will be our first beach cleanup of the year on Sunday, February 9 at 10 a.m. We will be cleaning up at South Shores Park on Mission Bay, which we've adopted through the California Coastal Commission. And I love a clean San Diego's adopt a beach program. Winter storms wash a lot of debris onto the beach and most groups concentrate their cleanups in the summer months. So there's a real need for cleanups this time of year. All supplies will be provi provided, but if you've got a re reusable gloves, a bucket, or a reusable water bottle handy, please bring those along. It helps us to reduce the waste uh, generated by the event. The paths are accessible for wheelchairs and leg braces and there are jobs for kids to do too. If you'd like to participate, all the details are on the Meetup and Facebook. Thank you. Our there we go. Our reading for today is the poem, I Am Running Into a New Year by Lucille Clifton and will be read for us by B. Hi. This is my first time to Sunday Assembly. Nice to meet you all. <laughs> I Am Running Into a New Year by Lucille Clifton. I am running into a new year, and the old years blow back like a wind that I catch in my hair, like strong fingers, like all my old promises, and it will be hard to let go of what I said to myself about myself when I was 16 and 26 and 36, even 36, but I am running into a new year, and I beg what I love and leave to forgive me. If it's your first time at Sunday Assembly, can you raise your hand? Okay, you're all volunteered for the next reading. We are very privileged to have Dr. Jin with us today. Dr. Yishi Jin is a professor of neurobiology, which sounds really impressive. And uh, I was a high school dropout. So she works at UC, or she got her professor, she was a professor at UC San Diego. And um, she's going to be talking to us about the connections of a more physical kind. Dr. Jin. It is my first time and to be uh, with San Diego Assembly, but it's also first time for me to come over this area. Um, I live um, north. Um, so actually, uh, before I start, we already realized there could be a couple challenges. One is, as um, the little girl says, I just had my braces on after uh, 50 years, so it's kind of a feeling weird at the speaking. And second, um, we realized the incompatibility between my computer 
and Dolores' computer. There might be movies that's not playing, so I will try either mimic or use my computer to show you the sun. Um, so it's, um, thank you for um, inviting me to come here to talk to you about my work. Um, I probably say as I started from China, but California has been my um, home state. Um, I got my PhD from Berkeley and then basically from Berkeley moved down to San Diego. Um, so what I will tell you, um, I'm really a researcher that working in the lab and that trained as a molecular biologist and learned about the genetics and worked with laboratory animal to hoping to study, um, discover things that could be relevant to um, generally understanding of human and animals. So if you can, okay, so I think this days with computer and you know, the internet, you will see that the brain, our brain, is very complicated. There's always um, lights that's firing. And what those firing is actually referring to a very minute structure, it's called a synapse. Um, synapse is actually means connection. And um, so the bottom one, since this laser pointer doesn't work, so the bottom is basically illustration of a synaptic connection by graphic design. But in a scientific world, the next slide is actually the very top is an illustration that the textbook, high schools or elementary school textbook you tell you, that is a synapse has two, three parts. The very top is called um, presynaptic terminal where there's a lot of holes are little vesicles that will deliver a message. And then they have to be crossed to um, its partner, so those are called the postsynaptic. But in the real science, the, what the synapse look like is down the two uh, pictures. Those are real samples that's put it actually under electron microscope. And as a way to show you, in order to really see those textbook view, it requires many layers of technology. And its synapse is a tiny structure. That's why we use the electron microscope. And um, so, but um, the, all that subtle, you know, tiny structures, almost like we're building a house, made out of many molecules. So molecules means the proteins, the lipids, and sugars, and um, so one way to actually know what those um, proteins or molecules are, this is goes into the biochemistry, which basically means you're grinding up a brain and you try to figure out how many proteins are there. It turns out that in that tiny presynaptic terminal, there's over thousand um, different proteins. And um, just like we're building tiny things, you, you will have to, I'm actually, this is very cool because this afternoon I'm going to pack my house and then start my house remodeling. And I went to all the um, appliances telling me all these things. I said, why are there so many things? And they said, yes, you have to have every single nails match the stuff. So um, the, similarly, um, the postsynaptic side also have many molecules. They're not identical. They needed to be in the right place in the um, presynaptic, meaning they relieve signal, and postsynaptic means we receive signal. They are different molecules. So the illustration there is very much a scientific jargon. Every single bowl or oval shape is a scientist illustrate that is a distinct protein and place them in the right place within that ultra uh, minute space. And um, next slides. The, the next point is basically is that the, what got people or got me, drive me to study synapses is the fact that there's increasing uh, information from human patients that link to genetic changes uh, to diseases. In particular, I'm passionate about autism, but there's also schizophrenia, and there are also degenerations of various cases. So essentially, um, oh, you're going to the next one. So, oh, too fast, sorry. If we can go back, um, I'll, I'll can see here. Um, so that's what, where my basic science coming from. 
But I don't work with human. I'm not doctor, and it's harder to work with human samples. So I work with this nematode, as you see here, Cinerava didis elegans. Um, so it's working with this um, nematode is very simple. And on the side, it's just a desk with a microscope, a bunch of petri dishes. That's where I sit, and I look at the animal, and the animal just on that picture, the image. And I was hoping this um, movie play, but it doesn't. Basically, imagine nematode that just like a tiny snake. They will move around, and this is micro, but, but it, they're really wonderful. They're, they're, so the first thing I work with them, they're worm, but don't worry about it. This is actually free living worm. That is, um, they don't um, cause any parasite. They actually detect, it's good environmental detection um, a, um, organism to see how vi vibrant the environment is. Um, they're small, and I can see them. They, they don't require a whole lot of things to work with because they're cheap, that's the other thing, that to work in the lab. And uh, probably the most important for us is that this is the only animal, it is an animal, even it's a worm, you can freeze them in dry ice, liquid nitrogen, thinking about you know the Disney, um, he wanted to be frozen and then revive. That's not gonna happen. But with, but with this worm, you can free, we can freeze them, and then we can revive any day, any time. They will be exactly like the, what they're frozen. So that means we can store all the genetic information um, indefinite, and then give us a lot of time to um, work with. Okay, so the next slide is actually introduce you um, Sidney Brenner, and I don't know how many of you have heard him in um, different contexts. So he is called the father of C. elegans. Um, basically, he's a South African scientist, actually is a doctor, and then converted to do a basic science. He went to UK and he did a lot of fabulous things uh, telling us that uh, uh, how our proteins are made of amino acid. And, um, Perhaps this is right around the time I was born, and he decided it's time for him to explore a real organism rather than biochemistry. So he wrote a letter to his director, and you can read this, and if I actually read it, that might take a longer time. The bottom line is that he wrote a very simple proposal, 500 words, is that he wanted to play with an organism where he could use a genetic methods to really understand how its nervous system control movement, to control um, thinking. So they, he got the funding support, and then he started next one. Um, so he chose, he actually came over to Berkeley, uh, learned about, there's a big nematode um, biology department, learned about the various nematodes from Berkeley professors, and then set his heart on this particular species called Cinerabaditis elegans, or C. elegans. One is, um, so this is a simple biology that essentially, uh, C. elegans is hermaphrodite, that is the self-fertilized. So you don't need to do any difficulty to maintain them. And um, the eggs live uh, uh, outside the mother, and so it goes through all these processes. You can see from fertilization to they become a young kid, and then to um, grow up a teenager, so finally become sexual mature again. It only takes about three days. So, <laughs> very cool, huh? Um, so because it has such short life, then you can actually changing their DNA content to generate the genetic changes and ask what will happen to the animal. And then you can study that the molecular basis of life. Um, so um, the, this actually also very unique uh, nematode. The, uh, the, it, the number of cells uh, in making up this animal is fixed. There's a 959 from one to another. So everyone is identical. So that is also why geneticists always love this animal to study for its biology. And more so, let me just show, in fact, Sidney Brenner did the first uh, so-called genetic screen by feeding the animals with chemicals to change their DNA. Now you see this wiggly um, worm, 
no longer move like a snake because it cannot move, so therefore it's called uncoordinated. So there's a lot of these mutations we ended up giving the name describe their mutant phenotype. It turns out this particular gene is absolutely essential for the synaptic signals from transmitted from the presynaptic terminal to post. Okay, so um, because this is um, you know general history, because he's a self-motivated uh, mission to really leading this field, he was awarded many prizes in about 2002, and he was given the Nobel Prize as has been recognized to be the highest honor. In fact, he's actually a long-term resident of um, San Diego, because, um, next slide, um, that since 1976, and he preferred uh, to be closer to the ocean. He was affiliated with the Salk Institute. And there he basically um, wrote, um, studied. And he's also very good, not just a scientist, he's very good uh, ethicist. So he wrote the columns and telling the young graduate students, young um, investigators, uh, what's it like, how to design um, a, you know, just general life around your choice. So he passed away just about a year ago. And um, for some of you would like to read, and there's a column called Uncle Sid, and uh, it's just one page. Um, he wrote for seven years, and um, one of the things we all love this, t t just share this, you can read, that, that is he self-advertised, he's a scientist, how to self-advertise in, in the era of Facebook, where you have to you know, advertise yourself. Um, so. That you can read that. I thought that was interesting without going through details. Um, there's a lot of history about, um, you can search on San Diego tribunes. Anyway, so now here comes to my work, I think. Next slide. So my work really is, again, is a, now showing you the electron micrographs that are the synapses, you need those vesicles and to hold uh, neurotransmitters and then to transmit signal to the postsynaptic cells. They're tiny, so the scale telling you they're very, very small. That is, not, cannot be detected by naked eyes. We do a lot of technologies. This is called um, e electron micrograph tom tomogram. That is, we literally collecting images of one nanometer um, on a section, and then we use computer to reconstruct it. So this movie just basically shows that we can resolve a single molecule, single vesicles, those uh, pink ones, and then there are different ones, so the red ones, they has to be come together to make that synapsis. So this is the question that uh, I'm interested. How do the components come together? Next slide. And um, because they're very small, naked eyes can't uh, see it, and you really have to come up with a way um, to allow me to see as a researcher. So this comes to a lot of this driven by um, technology at the time. So this one, I presumably, uh, many of you have seen or heard about it. It's called the green fluorescent protein. Raise hands. Yeah, so you know, one of the fascinating things, just go to aquarium, there's all this jellyfish and they give you sparkling um, patterns because they have a protein that can just give you fluorescent, so that you can, especially good in Halloween, so that, you know, that, that kind of thing, this is a like fluorescent thing. So one of the technology was discovered over 25 years ago is that um, they can take a jellyfish protein and to place it in any organisms, and they can just, um, Outside of jellyfish, they can still show green fluorescence. The slide shows there. So essentially, uh, basically, it's a jellyfish protein. You, on that plate, the blue is a bacteria. You see them fluorescent. And the middle one is a C. elegans. You see them green. And then Drosophila rabbit, actually. And then some people one time said there's a you know, monkey can be all uh, green monkeys as well. They're totally so. When um, animals taking this gene, they can totally live fine. There's, it's absolutely no harm to whatsoever. So therefore, this gave me the idea to start my own work. The next slide. It, oh, so this 
de development of this uh, uh, green fluorescent protein as a way to see things also won the Nobel Prize in 2008. And I presume some of you have heard uh, Roger Chen from UCSD. Okay, so um, he's a, he has, he, um, so he's he's a he's a genius that in terms of developing all sorts of fluorescent proteins, all sorts of ways for as he's a chemist training, and um, basically develop many reagents for us to see um, with the magic that essentially in the lab. Um, and all along with the others. And, um, and this technology using green fluorescence later on got another prize um, in 2014 that is so-called super resolution microscopy. I mean, that's when it's basically allow you to see things within um, detection visual separation level. Okay, so next slide. Yeah, okay, 10 minutes already? I have 10 more? Okay. So, um, so the way I was thinking, this is a blow up that little black dots that I've just shown you into a single a gigantic um, computer illustration. That is, those single synapt vesicles are full of proteins. And there's many proteins that make them to function. But they have to be packed in a very small 70 nanometer size. So here it comes down to, so if I wanted to study how synapses, how vesicles gets to where they should be, and then I can put green fluorescent protein to one of the protein, okay? Now, next slide. So this is a very um, fascinating. And you see that um, my logo, my, the worm, that's a worm. And you see all those um, bright spots. Those are green fluorescent proteins that I put into the C. elegans. And I put so, is actually tech, the, the, put them together with a synaptic vesicle protein. And you see those uh, black and white ones, and there's a, um, the so-called uh, white puncta. Each one of them is ultra-structurally defined synapse, okay? And so that's the basically, that's, that is my work. That essentially all I do is look at those individual um, dots, white dots. And, that, and then I say, okay, now I can see a synapse and then I can do genetics. That is, I can, next slide. That basically I uh, feed the C. elegans uh, with nasty chemicals and DNA gets changed. Then I can see, oh, this molecule, there are three examples, and it's called the SID1, SYD-1, 2. Every one of them, when they are mutated, meaning the protein is gone, and they start changing the shape of the dots that I'm looking at it. Means they're changing the synapses. And it actually causes the synapses communication weakened, the animals shows behavior deficits. So my other side of work is then using a lot of the um, training my graduate students' postdocs and working with those proteins, place them in synaptic terminal will be the next one. So essentially, this is now textbook illustration is that each of the round green circle is a synaptic vesicle. Each of the protein that I worked with or identified it's color-coded and corresponding to the synaptic terminal as an illustration. So basically says I succeeded in seeing the synapse one and then actually find the molecules that's changing the synapses and then place those molecules in the synapses to say they're functionally important. And the important thing is that I worked with the C. elegans and I should point out all these molecules are present in our body. Okay, so essentially that's why I uh, use a lab to study that proteins and genes that's relevant to ourself. Okay, so that's the first part of my work, and that is how to study synapses. Now I'm going to talk about the second part of my work. Again, it's more related to uh, as I'm growing older, learning more things about relate my work to uh, medical applications. This is talking about axon regeneration, so slides. So um, axon regeneration, and actually it's been known over um, 1,500, 2,000 years from the doctor's um, record. That is, in adults, when um, 
axon gets damaged for whatever reason, stroke or um, accident, and human will not be able to regenerate their axons, repair themselves. And scientifically, the person who studied this really extensively is that gentleman, that's Ramoni Cajal. Have anybody heard of him? He's a Spanish, um, so it's basically, he's a Spanish uh, neuroscientist and there was a doctor too. And he did this work in the old days and started in the uh, late 1900s that really is using microscope in his own kitchen. And so what you see here, that, that is not, it's not a lab, so microscope in front of him. And he basically took animal samples and then to crush their nerve, okay, or to transect their nerve. Afterwards, he looked at what happens to those axons, the damaged axons. So the image, the picture that's shown here, that really representative, that damaged axons in adults they do not, they're not able to fix themselves. What they become is those, um, the, air, the red arrowheads, it, they become this so-called round ends. Those round ends are called dystrophic bulbs. That is the sign the axons start dying. They no longer can, can be alive. Okay, so therefore there's a lot of studies for us to ask that other ways to preventing the sign of death by preventing the formation of dystrophic bulbs. So, next slides. Now here, I um, developed a technology that is, again, with the C. elegans, is very small, it's transparent, I can use GFP, green fluorescent and protein, to see those neurons, which you see here, that we call PLM. And um, I hope this movie does play the important thing. There you go, I use a laser and I cut those axons, and then they start growing, okay? They start responding, they're responding, they grow, but they actually don't fix themselves. Even in C. elegans, that when they become mature, and once they damage, they don't actually grow. So this then gave me a way to look for, what, mutate the C. elegans genome, says what happens, what could promote them grow. And next slide. It's a big uh, slice, it's very dense. What it means is that um, a nematode, you probably don't see because they're micro, they're, they live in your soil or tomatoes or rotten apples. Um, they have about 21,000 genes. Human has 30,000 genes, okay? And out of that, 8,000 of our genes are exactly the same as C. elegans. So what I do is, to basically mutate those 8,000 nematode genes individually and ask them how, when they're gone, how to respond to this laser injury. Okay, so essentially you can see those the images that we'll do. Bottom line is we're able to find genes, the next one. Um, okay, so I, I'm gonna skip this one because the movie doesn't do. Okay, so yeah, let's just keep it. So here's a gene that um, becoming very interesting. So what, when I see WT, that's what the normal uh, regenerating axon, that is it actually do grow and it has a sign of uh, growing. And then when you take this gene out, the middle panel, you see the growth distance is very short, okay? And they will become that um, dead sign. And, but if I actually make this gene more active, and then you can see now they grow a lot more, okay? Um, so this gene, we have, human have two, and worm C. elegans has one. And we can also find the next slides. Um, unfortunately, that movie doesn't play. Basically, we, in the lab, we can study many ways. We can show how to actually increase this gene's activity one of them is simple calcium. The calcium is a major signal. Okay, so next one. Um, the, the connection to it is our work from C. elegans showed that we active this uh, protein, the, um, the axons will grow more. And more recently, there's a study from UCLA Medical School actually shown is that patients suffered a stroke if they take this um, drug that inhibiting CCR5, which is 
uh, quite probably popularized because it linked it to HIV. And um, those patients actually recover faster from stroke. One of the reasons they recover faster is because in the human kinase, it become more active. Okay, so essentially, now we link to our C. elegans findings and to human. The question is, what should be uh, everybody using CCR5 drugs? Probably not. So there's a, there's a way to go. Um, and the next one, there's another um, uh, interesting connection. Um, there's also, so basic scientists is basically finding a lot of things. For instance, in this particular case, that we know Alzheimer's and often come from accumulation of a particular proteins, in this case is apoproteins. And apparently, that when you have too much bad um, APOE proteins, and the, the kinase actually become reacting and gets activated. So there are things start thinking is that controlling or monitoring how this kinase from C. elegans to human, how to make them active or inactive, not only important for a motor cortex um, recovery repair, and can also help um, to preventing Alzheimer's. So that, that's older generation, older people care a lot more. With all of that, I think I'm ending my talk. And that is, I will always, so all of this work, as I lead a lab at UCSD, you see the Sangha, and this is a group of people who work tirelessly with me. And um, I have uh, also benefited from a lot of federal fundings as well as um, local UCSD fundings. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Jin. I found that fascinating to learn what we can learn from nematodes about preventing synapse degeneration. By far, I think the most relevant piece of the talk for me was learning about green fluorescent protein because I would love if my kids fluoresced. I, I can think of several instances where this would be useful at supermarkets, theme parks, hide and seek games. So will you, will you be available after for questions? So please, please do stop by if you would like Dr. Jin to, uh, if you'd like to hear her explain to me why it is both uh, ethical and possible to make my kids glow in the dark, <laughs> or if you have questions of your own. And now please welcome back to the stage your friend and mine. Let's get a Kraken with Tim McCracken. You had to get one in there, so. So when Laura pitched this song to me, I said, you know, I don't know if Sunday Assembly can sing this one or not. And I said, I don't know if I can sing it. But I, she said, no, they love this song. They, they know it. They love it. We've done it before. So go for it. So here we are. <laughs> I can 
see clearly now the rain is gone I see all the life obstacles in my way Gone are the dark clouds that had me blind It's gonna be a bright It's gonna be a bright, 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 sunshiny day. It's gonna be a bright, 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 sunshiny day. Woo! We did it fine. It went amazing. So one of our fan favorite portions of the assembly is um, the one that people resonate with the best is the personal moment. And this is a time where anyone can share about something personal to them. We've had funny stories about stealing donuts and we've had uh, serious stories about spousal abuse or about overcoming addiction, um, which was one of our Life Happens announcements this morning, still fighting addiction and winning. So I just want to um, encourage any of you who have a story in their heart, but maybe you don't want to read it out loud. We have professional readers that will read it for you um, or help you construct it. Um, anything you want to do or feel comfortable with, we just kind of want to get to know each other and we resonate with these stories. So I just want to invite up, where is Lynn at? Lynn to share her story. Okay, as some of you know, I recently made a trip back to my native Virginia. I was there for three weeks. And what I want to tell you about is my return journey. It began with a car ride with my sister-in-law, and it ended with an Uber ride. But in between, I took a train and a plane. My personal moment is what I learned on my roughly five-hour Amtrak train between Lynchburg, Virginia and Baltimore, Washington International Airport. It might best be titled, What to Know Before You Go. I boarded a nearly empty train and had assistance from a very friendly young man who helped me get my two large rolling suitcases up into the overhead uh, luggage rack. As the train gradually filled up, I was very lucky because nobody sat beside me. This meant that I could spend the next four and a half hours reviewing medical records for an upcoming neuropsychology case I had. When we stopped to unload passengers at the last stop before I knew we'd be arriving at BWI, I assumed that I would hear an announcement telling me how much time I had before we would get into BWI. I watched the scenery go by, I packed up my computer, I was all ready to disembark. The conductor finally made his announcement and said, we were going to be arriving at BWI in three minutes. Now when he announced that, I was like, only three minutes? You're kidding me. But, oh, so at that point my blood pressure begins rising a little bit because three minutes is not a lot of time to get all your luggage together and exit the train. Um, so I immediately stood up, climbed up on the edge of my seat because I'm so short, and I lifted down the first suitcase. No problem. When I went to lift down the second suitcase, I discovered that it was exactly the same width as the luggage rack, and so it was lodged into this overhead luggage rack with absolutely no give this way. And I was at the end where there was no handle. So I am trying desperately, standing on the edge of the seat, to lift this suitcase straight up. And now it's close to 50 pounds. I get no, no ability. I break fingernails. And the whole time I'm going, I can't get this down. I can't get this down. I'm getting louder. <sighs> I knew that three minutes had to have flown by as I'm struggling to get this suitcase down. No one's offering me help. There is no conductor in sight. Finally, a young woman sitting in front of me goes, I will help you get this bag down. She's just as short as I am, so she stands on her seat, but now she can reach the front of the bag where the handle is, so she gets the leverage, we get it down. 
by now my, my heart rate is up and I'm really panicking, thinking I'm gonna get stuck on this train. How am I gonna get back to the airport? Anyway, I hurriedly push my two large rolling suitcases towards the exit, but I fear that I'm not gonna make it, so I leave the smaller one in the aisle and I make my way to the door and I take the large rolling suitcase and I place it in the door thinking, hey, that'll keep it from closing. I'll be okay. So then I go back and I grab the other suitcase. I come to the door. Well, when I return to the door, the train has begun to move. And there is no time to think about this. I'm in the doorway with one suitcase almost out. The other one's behind me. So I push the big suitcase out and I step out of the train. And of course, when a train is moving and you step out, the motion of the train is going to knock you to the ground. You do not remain standing. I landed on my elbow, my butt, and my back. And as I'm lying there, stretched out parallel to the train, which is going on up the track, I'm thinking, there goes my other suitcase. <laughs> what do I do now? So this young, not young, this very nice man comes up, helps me get up, and I'm standing there and he's making sure I'm okay and I'm shaking and the train is traveling and then I hear screeching. The train comes to a stop and I'm thinking, okay, now what's gonna happen as I'm shaking? And so the train stops and I start trotting up the platform trying to guess where might my suitcase be? How far has this train actually traveled with my suitcase? Are they going to open the door? I don't, really don't know what's gonna happen. I come to a door and I stop. The door's open and my suitcase is there. I reach in and I grab it and I pull it off. And then I start back down the platform with my suitcase. This nice gentleman has been standing there with my other luggage so that nobody walked off with it. And I get back to him with it and I'm still shaking. And then all of a sudden these two conductors converge and they wanna make sure I'm okay. And I am okay. I say I probably am going to have a bruised elbow, but I'm fine. No, I don't need to file a report. You guys can go ahead and leave. And this nice gentleman keeps saying, well, do you need to sit down? Because he could see how discombobulated I was. And I get all confused, like I'm trying to get on an elevator when I don't need to. He assists me to the uh, shuttle stop for the airport shuttle, and all is good. And so here's the moral of my story or the more roles. First, know before you go the time between the last stop before your destination and that destination. Know before you go that there are not always going to be people that will help you just spontaneously and ask for help directly. Know before you go that really large suitcases should not be taken on Amtrak trains. <laughs> and know before you go that Amtrak trains are not as smart as San Diego trolleys. <laughs> San Diego trolleys will not move if the door is open. I assumed that was the case with Amtrak trains and I learned otherwise. And finally, know wherever you go that total strangers will offer help. There are good people everywhere. Lynn, thank you so much for sharing what you learned on your Amtrak trip. I, I rode Amtrak once and I didn't learn anything. <laughs> I, I feel like a real dummy now. <laughs> so our MC address today is in keeping with our theme of connection. And connections can include things like love or they can include healthy boundaries, like if you share a bed and you have your own blanket. It could mean getting to know someone and opening up and being vulnerable with them. Like a blanket for me, and then another blanket for you. It, it could be realizing that the person sitting across from you is not just a projection of your mind, but their own person with their own desires and struggles. And then not getting really upset if you wake up and say you have no blankets. It, it could be learning to communicate and share your feelings with someone. But maybe your wife has all the blankets. It could be having patience with the exasperating 
blanket people in your life? <laughs> like a giant blanket burrito of wifey. We made our lists separately. <laughs> so we've had a connection for the last 21 years now. Uh, next slide, please. Not that one. That one. <laughs> Our, our connection all started because of one person. One sagely wise person who said just the right thing at just the right time. When I was 16, there was a girl who was flirting with me shamelessly about as subtly as a jackhammer. But it was my mom who had to say something to me. That girl likes you. She's being really obvious. I think I annoyed her. <laughs> and just like that, I hit puberty. So uh, we dated for five and a half years. The first, uh, starting when we were 16, but we looked nine. The first two years, I worked at In N Out Burger, and our store won this free trip to a water park. So you could bring one guest. And I said to my then boyfriend, hey, we're going to Waterworld, which, if you grew up in the Sacramento area, is like the Yosemite of water parks. Would you like to come with me? I would. I turned down a summer job at Target, which was training at this exact time, so that I could join her on this one-day trip to Waterworld. And when we got off the, the bus to get there, I realized that uh, she was incorrect. We had actually gone to Manteca Water Slides, which is a little bit like if you ordered some water slides, but on Wish. <laughs> so I see the look in his face, and I'm like, Oh no, it'll still be fine. It'll still be a great day. Prophetic words. There was this tall water slide at the top of this rickety set of stairs that you could go down head first or feet first on this mat. And so, of course, my girlfriend goes first and she goes head first, so now I have to go head first. So I was standing up there trying to figure out how I, I pitched myself forward. And what happened instead was I slipped backward and lost my mat and hit the back of my head on a stair railing. So I did not get to ride that slide or any more slides that day and had to walk down the stairs. Uh, but my, my poor girlfriend who was waiting for me at the bottom was waiting and waiting and then saw a solitary mat come down the slide <laughs> as though a miracle had happened. So I finally found him. They had to escort him to the lifeguard station, check him for brain damage, and wouldn't let him ride for fear of concussion. I got to see Alexis in a bathing suit, so in summary, it was a great trip. <laughs> Speaking of giving up your summers for a girl, um, when our relationship started to get more serious, I was actually, at the time, going to a church that encouraged me to be a full-time missionary in Papua New Guinea. And I had already done the training, lived in the jungle, been to other countries, all of that. So I have this boyfriend, and I'm like, hey, if you want to take this relationship, if this is going all the way, uh, you have to go live in the jungle. So I did. I traveled to Papua New Guinea for six weeks and lived with a tribe and learned talk pigeon, which was the trade language. Uh, of course, we never became missionaries, and many years later, she left that belief system entirely. So you're welcome for the bucket showers, and um, you could go by yourself now. No thanks, I'm good. At one point in those five and a half years that we were dating, I read a book called I Kiss Dating Goodbye, and I tried to break up with my girlfriend, but she wouldn't let me. <laughs> it might have been I Kiss Dating Goodbye, but I kissed while dating. So uh, that breakup didn't happen. And in fact, here's how that worked out. Uh, next slide. <laughs> so thank you, kissing. <laughs> All right, so after we got married, we moved to Longview, Texas to finish up my husband's last year of college. And my college invited us to compete in a newlywed game where couples were quizzed about how well they knew each other. And we were newlyweds, but we had been dating for several years, so we figured we had this in the bag. So to change up the newlywed game, they pitted us against a married college professor, been married for decades, 
um, a couple that was dating, and then just to be for fun, they picked two random strangers from the audience the day of who had never met. And we killed it. And by killed it, we lost to the marriage veterans, we lost to the dating couple, but thankfully, we moved, up, moved out of Texas because we also lost to the random strangers. Okay, okay, but we're, 14 years later, we're still married, and those strangers are in jail for tax fraud. Is that true? I, I mean, maybe, they were really shifty. So, <laughs> part of connection is uh, knowing yourself, but an interesting part of being in a connection with someone else is when you know them or something about them better than they know themselves. And for example, after moving out of Texas back to California, we woke up one morning and I said to my new husband, good morning, tiger. But he didn't respond to the new nickname I had just given him, so I had to say it a couple more times before finally he asked me, okay, what's with the tiger? And I said, it's fitting. And he said, why is it fitting? And I said, because of your giant tiger tattoo. Which of course I have no tiger tattoo, but as she gestures to my arm and I roll up my sleeve, I have this tiger tattoo <laughs> that I, I later learned was a temporary tattoo that she had applied while I slept. <laughs> you know, like a creepy stalker type of person. I had never been gaslit until that moment. Speaking of gas, and yes, that's the terrible segue we came up with, carbon, carbon monoxide poisoning is a real danger. It's when uh, carbon monoxide replaces the oxygen in your bloodstream. Symptoms of carbon monoxide poisoning include dizziness and being really out of it and headaches. I learned about this on the internet. Yeah, so when we were new parents, my wife woke me up at 3 a.m. one morning uh, telling me that we were all dying of carbon monoxide poisoning. And she was army crawling across the floor of our apartment, which doesn't make any sense because carbon monoxide doesn't rise or sink. And she had opened all of the doors and windows and she was frantically waving her arms. Like that? Like that, in front of our, our daughter's face trying to waft fresh air into her lungs and I felt fine and our daughter seemed fine and our apartment seemed fine aside from the fact that it was inhabited by this panicky demon <laughs> but of course I went to Walmart at three in the morning and purchased a carbon monoxide detector because what else was I going to do say she was wrong so I saved our lives it turns out that vertigo has many of these symptoms, especially paired with a ton of paranoia. We all lived. The end. The end. So why are we sharing these kind of bizarre stories with you about these connections? Well, last September, Charles and I got to go to Sunday Assembly London, um, which is where our organization was founded by Lady and Duke, no, I'm kidding, two comedians from London. And, um, and during that speaker's talk, he talked about having these experiences that go wrong and how those make better stories. And that knowing that in the time can help you through those struggles and strengthen your connections. That's right. So we were in London for the first time and we used Google Maps to get around everywhere, of course, so we didn't get lost and it was fantastic, but a very boring story, as you can see. The better story is the time we got lo actually lost, which was uh, we were driving from our apartment in Hillcrest to um, just a few blocks down the road to a little place called the hospital I would be giving birth. I, I missed one turn and got on the freeway. <laughs> There is no freeway between us and the hospital. And this was particularly bad because, you know, it was right down the road. We'd been there a million times for all our birthing classes. And, you know, I was crowning. That you were having mild contractions. I was having mild contractions. It felt like crowning. But we were building our connection together through adversity. <laughs> Speaking of hospitals, around this time, I began to learn more about kidneys, and namely that some people are born with two healthy kidneys, many of us, while some people don't have any. 
And I began to get interested in donating my kidney to someone, and I talked to my wife about it. And being a super supportive person I am, I shut that business right down. But she did agree to come meet with the transplant coordinator with me and ask our questions. And it turned out that some of her concerns were marginally overblown. Did you know the kidney donors die from the cold? Did you know kidney donors are more likely to be attacked by dogs in the street? Did you know the kidney donors never get the winning lottery numbers in their fortune cookies? Did you know that after kidney donation surgery, it messes up your guts so much you're missing one whole side of yourself that if you stand still too long, you start leaning like a carnival cruise? Only that last one is true. <laughs> so it turned out some of these were fear-based instead of evidence-based objections I had. And once we sat down and asked all our questions and learned kind of the facts and the science and the medical stuff, long story short, we both became kidney donors. And in a miraculous twist of fate, the first kidney donors uh, to married couple to both altruistically donate ever. Um, and we ended up learning that when a bunch of news crews broke into our hospital room while I was recovering. He was fully recovered. I was still the one in the bed. And to bring this back, it's just funny that two teenagers with a tenuous connection, thankfully your mom intervened there, that grew through adversity, that strengthened, that then branched out to reach people who were strangers, saving 10 lives in two chains of kidney donation chains, that we have a connection that's spread unbeknownst to us to the kids and grandkids of people we'll never meet. And not to mention, next slide please, our uh, daughter, or our son we adopted, or the hundreds of people who share their disability who have touched our lives. And the most intimate connection of all. Our marriage. Me to my blankets. <laughs> and now we're going to recognize a moment of silent reflection. If we could have the folks who are giving announcements come up, please. As these people are coming up, we are looking for recurring monthly donors. If you are a regular here, if you enjoy what we're doing, if you would like to be a part of it, we are looking, our goal this year is to add three recurring monthly donors in any amount or one one-time donor in the amount of $152,323.45. So if you would like to help out as a recurring monthly donor or as a one-time donor, either way, we welcome your involvement. Right, we've got next slide. There we go. Um, game night this Wednesday. It's going to be at the Record Wesley residence. We have kids and cats if you're allergic, and there's nothing I can do. There's just so many cats. Um, the bulletin is misprinted. It's supposed to be at 6.30, but if you do come at 6, I will put you to work cleaning bathrooms. Okay, so we are, actually, Stephen is leading an urban walk next month. Uh, or no, this month, I'm sorry, it's next Saturday. There's this little shack in Imperial Beach, right? And it's Stardust Donuts. 
And if you've been to Stardust Donuts, best donuts you'll eat in your entire life, I, I swear. Not on God, but I swear. Um, uh, so it's these two brothers, and who knows Seinfeld soup Nazi episode? You swear that you walk up and they're going to go, no donuts for you. Okay, but they're super cranky. They get up early in the morning, they make their donuts, they sell out, they close. There are no hours. Well, one of them has died, and so they lost his brother, and his brother's running the shack. Now there are posted hours. He's super nice. Uh, I lived there 20 years ago, uh, and uh, he's still there. And it looks like a little shack. You would not believe they have the best donuts. Anyway, so the most important part is the walk. It's the donuts. Um, so Stephen is going to lead from a coffee shop, walk to the donuts, to the, the pier, Imperial Beach Pier, and then back to coffee, and it's a nice little stroll, flat, four miles, I think, round trip. Nice little stroll, quick. All right, next Saturday. Thanks. I got to read mine. Um, I'd like to invite all of you to the S word, a round table discussion on secular spirituality after the next Sunday assembly. Is this the first round table you've ever had? It's the first round table we've ever had. Okay. <laughs> Many of us avoid the word spiritual because of its longtime association with supernaturalism and superstition. But the S word has proven too useful to dismiss. Clinical researchers are now showing strong evidence that spirituality, defined secularly and objectively, is hardwired in our brains and necessary for thriving and focusing on spiritual commonalities is proving a bridge between secular and faith communities, making it easier for each side to work together on critical issues like climate change. Because the round table happens an hour after February's Sunday assembly, lunch will be available at no charge. My uh, good friend and colleague, Philip Clay Professor Philip Clayton is leading and he's fantastic. So mark your calendars and invite your hardcore atheist friends because uh, we would like to hear what they have to say. They tend to be the most against the word spirituality. It should be an interesting discussion. We did it. We got through our 68th Sunday assembly and we're going to leave you with a song from Tim the Kraken McCracken, or as he very much prefers to be called, MC Kraken.
just let me know Although you run true, I'm attracted to you all the more Why do I need you so? Hey, 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 baby, baby, try to find A little time that I'll make you mine I'll be home, I'll be beside the phone waiting for you And that's it for our 68th Sunday Assembly. Please share your thanks with Dr. Jin, with Tim, with Lynn, with B, and there will be coffee, drinks, and snacks over here. If you would like to join us for lunch after Sunday Assembly, we will be convening at Barrio Star. <laughs>